in many of the emails that you've sent us. This from Martin Saunders in London. I see no change in PMQs. The Prime Minister was incapable for whatever reason of answering Harriet Harman's simple question. This from Susan Wright in Worcester. Well done, Hattie, for some proper opposition questions this week. David Cameron didn't answer a single one of them and gave an unconvincing display. Brian James says, listening to David Cameron on PMQs, I'm wondering what happened to the new politics. He sounds like he's in opposition. Shouldn't he be talking about what he's going to do about the financial crisis instead of blaming Labour? Someone should remind him he's won the election. But Damien Limmock says, David Cameron has shown some real strength and completely overshadows the hypocritical rants of Harriet Harman. How Ms Harman has the nerve to talk about where cuts should be when the Labour Party couldn't say themselves when in power is utterly beyond belief. And this comes from another Damien. Uh, David Cameron has shown a lot of promise and his answers to even members of the opposition are well structured, honest and dignified. And then this slightly cheeky one from Jeremy Castle. Does Vince Cable sleep? Is he sleepy or just have a headache? He keeps rubbing his eyes and looking like he was about to nod off. <laughs> Maybe both. Maybe. Uh, Vince, wake up. <laughs> the interesting thing for me, Nick, was not the exchanges between the two front benches, but the rather unhelpful, indeed in some cases, downright hostile questions to Mr Cameron from his own Conservative backbenchers. That's right, there were three. I'm just checking yeah. my notebook. Philip Davis saying yeah. uh, people uh, uh, didn't vote to let people out of prison, prison. he said. Douglas Carswell saying, why can't we have a referendum mm. on Europe? And Graham ba Brady, the new chairman of the uh, backbench, and it is still the backbench 1922 committee, effectively asking a question he didn't use the words about plans to raise capital gains tax. And it is interesting that one impact of the coalition has been, in a sense, to liberate Conservative backbenchers to say, well, we can question things that are not directly conservative policy, the mm. coalition policy. And they've done that. They've done it very early in the life of the new government. One uh, conservative backbencher of that tendency that Nick's been talking about said to me, Francis Mob, that w w we want to, we meaning his group of people, we want to be regarded as the third arm of this coalition. You've got the Lib Dems are part of it, the Cameroon Tories are the other part, but we want you to realise that there's a third element to this, the Tory backbenches who are not Cameroon. What do you say to that? Well, I think we're one party um, and uh, the government, uh, the ministers, in, the conservative ministers in the coalition uh, come from right across the party. It's very broad based indeed. So it's kind of, it's not factional in that way. But I mean, I think Nick's right. You're right that there is a different dynamic. A coalition changes the dynamic in loads of ways. And it'll take time for all this to settle down. Um, uh, do, you know, uh, I'm not a particularly partisan politician myself. And I mean, the idea that all Prime Minister's questions from your own side should all be kind of hurrah, uh, aren't you doing a wonderful job questions, um, isn't what Parliament should be like. Parliament no, but you may is, think that is, would come in three months or even three years' time for it to happen after three PMQs is quite surprising. It's just a sign of the momentum behind the government. Everything's getting done much more quickly. <laughs> we'll let that hang in the air, I think. <laughs> I won't reply.